In 2014, Pure Flix Studio released the film God's Not Dead. It's this sort of Love Actually style movie where we follow an ensemble cast. But instead of romance and Christmas spirit, God's Not Dead is about, um, God and why we should believe in God. The main plot centers around Josh Wheaton, a college student who defends faith against a professor who wants his students to renounce God. Honestly, the movie's pretty fun to watch. It did well too, raking in $100 million in the box office and through DVD sales. More than that, it sort of revitalized the Christian propaganda film and put Pure Flix on the map. So I'm going to talk about God's Not Dead. I don't have a specific agenda exactly, I just want to see how this movie works, what it's trying to say, and how it says it. That's this video, The Strange World of Christian Propaganda. If you cannot bring yourself to admit that God is dead for the purposes of this class, then you will need to defend the antithesis, that God is not dead. I'm going to start off this video by talking about some of the arguments Josh Wheaton puts forth in defense of God. I didn't want to talk about these arguments so directly in this video. I mean, I feel like there's enough weird YouTube atheism out there already that my additions won't accomplish much. But I am going to go through some of Wheaton's points, and that's for two reasons. First, to some extent, the point of God's Not Dead is to give us reasons to believe in God. So it only makes sense to see if those reasons are good. Second, not talking about the arguments in this movie almost made me feel douchey. If I didn't spend at least some time thinking through the positions in this film, I'd be just like Jeff, the philosophy professor who wants to presuppose the absence of God, and who won't just listen to reason. But know this, if you truly feel a need to continue with this charade, I will make it my personal mission to destroy any hope of a law degree in your future. And who wants to be like him, you know, he's a jerk, he gets hit by a car. With that in mind, let's jump in. There are three classroom scenes where Wheaton says his piece about God. Let's look at each of them. In the first, he gives his most compelling argument, an argument from timing. Most cosmologists now agree that the universe began some 13.7 billion years ago in an event known as the Big Bang. For 2,500 years, most scientists agreed with Aristotle on the idea of a steady-state universe, uh, that the universe has always existed with no beginning and no end. Uh, but the Bible disagreed. In the 1920s, Belgian astronomer George Lemaitre, he said that the entire universe, jumping into existence in a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, out of nothingness in an unimaginably intense flash of light, is how he would expect the universe to respond if God were to actually utter the command in Genesis 1-3, let there be light. Basically, he's saying we have good reason to believe in God because the universe came into existence in a way fitting with Genesis. And yeah, I can sort of see where he's coming from here, but this is a case where Wheaton is cherry-picking information in the Bible. So like, when I think about Genesis, the first thing that pops into my head is God saying, let there be light. And that would be perfect for Wheaton's point, since the Big Bang came with an explosion of light. But light actually isn't the first thing God made in the Bible. Before he created light, he made a formless primordial earth. And that ordering of events runs totally counter to the Big Bang. Scientists tell us that planets emerged long after the universe was born. So the Bible doesn't give us some super accurate account of the formation of everything. The only thing it has in common with the Big Bang Theory is that they both claim the universe came into being at some point. And that's just not an incredibly impressive commonality. I mean, there are only two options here either the universe came into being, or the universe always existed. The Bible got this one right, but it had a pretty good shot of getting it right just by guessing. It's telling that basically every other mythology in human history also got this one right. In the second little lecture Wheaton gives, he offers an argument that's almost identical to the one I just showed. It's also an argument from timing, except this time it's about the origin of humans instead of the universe. Which is why, after contemplating his own theory, 
Darwin uttered his famous statement, Natura non facit sotum, meaning nature does not jump. Well, as noted, author Lee Strobel pointed out that if you can picture the entire 3.8 billion years that scientists have say life has been around as one 24-hour day, in the space of just about 90 seconds, most major animal groups suddenly appear in the forms of which they currently hold, not slowly and steadily, as Darwin predicted, but in evolutionary terms, almost instantly. I'm not going to talk about this one for too long, but I will say that it actually weakens the first argument to some extent. What makes Genesis interesting isn't just that God made things, it's that he made them in an order and in close proximity to each other. Like, God made the earth, three days after that he made plants, and three days after that he made people. But with this cute little clock graphic, we can see clearly that people emerged very late in the history of the universe. Again, Wheaton defends the Bible because it gets broad claims right, people and the universe did come into existence, but he pretends that the more specific, incorrect claims just don't exist. Wow, this is taking longer than I thought it would. In the third and final lecture, Josh makes a totally different sort of argument. An argument from morality. For Christians, the fixed point of morality, what constitutes right and wrong, is a straight line that leads directly back to God. Oh. So you're saying that we need a God to be moral, that a moral atheist is an impossibility. No, but with no God, there's no real reason to be moral. I mean, there's not even a, a standard of what moral behavior is. Basically, he claims that God is the only way we could have objective morality, and we sure do want objective morality, so therefore God exists. I'm sort of letting this one slide here, because it's not really an argument for God's existence at all. Wanting to believe something's true isn't evidence that it's true, so even if God really were the only way to have an objective morality, that still wouldn't give us reason to believe in him. That said, there are plenty of ways that people try to establish objective morality without using God. I mean, there are utilitarians and natural rights theorists and virtue ethicists or whatever, and I'm not going to start explaining what those things are, but suffice it to say, they try to justify morals from a secular perspective. It's kind of sad that nobody raises this point, since these are the sorts of things people talk about in, you know, philosophy classes. If anyone, including the professor, was actually doing the reading, they would have pretty fast responses to what Wheaton says. And that's pretty much it. Those are the arguments for why God's not dead. And the most striking thing about them is how sparse they are. There's just two weak arguments from timing and a sort of non-argument from ethics. So we're left wondering, how else does this movie get its message across? The answer is that instead of giving us solid positions, God's Not Dead spends most of its time throwing rhetoric at its audience. Like, look at the way Professor Jeffrey Radisson is just destroyed in this movie. Do you hate me? God. <laughs> it's not even a question. Okay. Why do you hate God? Oh, this is ridiculous. Why do you hate God? Answer the question! In the first lecture scene, after Wheaton gives his argument, the prof gives a terrible rebuttal. I see you've carefully avoided the fact that Stephen Hawking, the world's most famous scientist, and who is not a theist, has recently come out in favor of a self-designing universe. And I quote, Because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something instead of nothing. It's why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to set the universe in motion." End quote. See, instead of saying anything about what his student claimed, he just makes a weird appeal to authority. Stephen Hawking said there's no God, so there, take that, Wheaton. This isn't an argument. It doesn't actually mean anything when it comes to the existence of God. The only reason Jeff says it is because it's an easy thing to refute. And Josh does just that in the next classroom scene. But, but if you can't bear to disagree with Hawking's thinking, then I suggest that you turn to page five of his book where he insists philosophy is dead. The thing about the movie here is that it treats science like it's a religion. 
pretends like people who advocate science treat the word of Hawking like it's the word of God. It's sort of ironic that a film about the value of religion delegitimizes something by making it seem like religion. Over the course of the film, the audience also realizes that the professor isn't actually an atheist. He's just sad because his mom died, so naturally he hates God. When a 12-year-old watches his mother dying of cancer, it's only natural to beg God for her life. The appeal to authority and the reduction of atheism to personal trauma don't, like, make a point. They're just rhetorical tactics meant to make atheism seem more vulnerable than it is. The movie is littered with this sort of rhetoric. Let's look at Amy, a gotcha journalist who is diagnosed with cancer. When she tells her boyfriend the news, this is what he says. We had fun. <laughs> you were my hot young girlfriend with the chic job. I was your upwardly mobile, charming, successful boyfriend. And we were together because we each got something out of the relationship that we wanted. God, he's the best. And again, this doesn't advocate faith in God. It advocates thinking that atheists are awful yuppies. Earlier in the plot, we have another scene like this. See, at the beginning of the movie, Amy's also uh, an awful yuppie. She's a blog writer who works for the, uh, New Left. I blog the New Left. Here's a scene where she interviews the dude from Duck Dynasty. You've made a fortune selling devices that are designed to lure waterfowl to their deaths. Uh, I guess when you say you, you're referring to the whole group of my family, which would be y'all. You could just change it to y'all, that'd be an easier expression. That way it'll get everybody in there. So, y'all have made a fortune, isn't that right? We're doing all right. We can certainly buy bigger tires on our trucks and four-wheelers to get out in the mud with, so life is good. What makes you think you have the moral right to go around maiming and killing innocent animals? So what do you say to people who are offended by your show, not just because of the hunting, but because you openly pray to Jesus in every episode? Hey, we're not trying to offend anybody, all right? If they don't want to watch the show, they can turn the channel. This moment is interesting on a bunch of levels. First, there's this weird conflation of animal rights and atheism that I don't fully understand. Like, I guess there's a cultural connection between veganism and secularism, but it seems like a pretty random thing to target. Second, the presence of the Duck Dynasty dude, Willie Robertson, is clearly a dog whistle to evangelical Christians. In 2012, Phil Robertson, Willie's dad, gave an interview where he criticized the editors of Duck Dynasty for trying to get him to not talk about Jesus so much. So this scene isn't really about faith or God or anything like that. Instead, it's about rhetorically dividing the world into two camps and putting those camps in conflict. You're either the new left, a snobbish, atheistic animal lover, or you're the evangelical right, a folksy, religious, uh, duck hater. By dividing the world this way, the film makes it really easy to hate the secular world. They're not just people who don't believe, they're also insufferable and antagonizing. As a side note, that guy, Phil Robertson, is kind of a total dick. In later interviews, he said that black people were happier in the 60s under Jim Crow, and he claimed that gay people were full of murder, envy, strife, and hatred. Jeez. Uh, you know, these interviews came out after God's Not Dead was filmed, so it doesn't bear directly on the movie, but, you know, look at your golden boy now, Pierflix. Let's talk about another character, Aisha. Aisha is a Muslim girl who, over the course of the movie, finds Jesus. And the movie uses Aisha's father to make a point about how bad Islam is when compared to Christianity. See, this dad is sort of a bad guy. He forces his daughter to wear a hijab when she doesn't want to, and he hits and disowns her when he realizes she's converted. So, the movie's making some claims here against Islam, that it's oppressive and restricts access to the outside world. I don't think it's bad inherently to criticize religion, but the movie here isn't really talking about Islam at all. We don't see what these people believe or why they believe it. We just see how lame it all is, 
Basically, the film reduces Islam to a prop to make it look scary and alien when compared to Christianity. You're beautiful. I wish you didn't have to do that. It's from my father. He's very traditional. What's more interesting about the Aisha sections, though, is how they get at a hypocrisy of God's Not Dead. See, they show this dad telling his daughter she has to wear the hijab. I know it's hard living in their world and being apart from it. A world you can see but can't touch. And the audience is supposed to say, he shouldn't be doing that. People should be allowed to act and believe whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anybody. And, you know, I agree with that statement, but do you want to know a group of people who don't agree? Evangelical Christians, the people who made and presumably watched this movie. Pureflix, the studio that made this movie, recently came out with a homeschooling curriculum to help parents shield their children from a secular education. Have we really learned from history? Because the same philosophy behind Nazi Germany, which is evolution, is now being mandated in the government schools across the nations in the Western world. It's weird for an organization to make that and then turn around and criticize another group of people who also want to protect their kids from the Western world. It doesn't quite sit right. But the movie pretty much avoids this problem by avoiding the specifics of evangelical Christianity altogether. There's never a mention of what Christians allow or don't allow, never a point when a Christian makes it clear that a certain act is impermissible because of God. By avoiding this nitty-gritty stuff, the movie allows evangelicals to look reasonable and loving. When it comes to Muslims, the focus is only on what they prohibit. When it comes to Christians, the focus is only on how cool they are. God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. And this sort of gets me to my main point about God's Not Dead. See, the opposition is always shown in really concrete terms. This guy's a bad dad because Islam. This guy's an atheist because his mom died. This guy's a dick because his mom is dying. Moms seem to explain a lot in this movie, but compared to that, Christianity is shown in really nebulous terms. It doesn't stand for any exact belief. Instead, it's sort of an amorphous blob of ideologies that changes depending on the situation. That was kind of a sweeping statement I just made, so let me give just two examples so you can see what I mean. At one point in the movie, Josh Wheaton is tasked with explaining why badness exists in the world if there's a god, and he says this. If God is all good, and God is all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist? The answer at its core is remarkably simple. Free will. So, okay, I'm not going to question this at all. Let's just assume that the reason bad things happen is just free will. Well, later in the movie, Jeff the Profef is just randomly hit by a car. More than that, the movie implies that this dying is all part of God's plan, so not exactly free will. Now, I understand that this is supposed to be a good thing. You know, he converts in his dying breath and all that. But I just don't see it as all that good, even within the film's logic. Having a car hit you is a bad thing on the face of it. Even if you end up going to heaven, the moments when you're bleeding out on the road are not pleasant. And that's fine, right? If Wheaton said that God works in mysterious ways or whatever, this scene would make sense. But he doesn't say that. He says badness is all caused by free will. So, the movie contradicts itself here. Let's look at another example. Throughout the movie, Wheaton gives all these reasons why science supports belief in God. I already talked about what he says, so I won't get into it again, but clearly the movie is suggesting that he gives good, rational reasons. But at the end of the movie, we have a scene that goes against this idea. When Amy goes to see the band Newsboys, this happens. So in a few minutes, you guys are going to go out there and you're going to sing about God and Jesus as if they're as real as you and me. How can you do that? 
Well, to us, they are as real. Instead of citing some argument for God, these guys keep it simple. They have faith, and we're supposed to accept here that faith and faith alone gives us reason to be Christian. But if there is a scientific rationale for God, why is faith even necessary? It doesn't seem like the sort of thing we'd need to have. Again, the movie seems to want something both ways. We do have good reason to think there's a God based on secular reasoning, but at the end of the day, faith is really where it's at. Well, I mean, I'd like to tell you I have the perfect answer, but it doesn't shake my underlying faith. My purpose here isn't to play some gotcha game with God's Not Dead or with evangelical Christianity in general. I'm not trying to convince anyone out of their beliefs, and I probably couldn't do that if I tried. Instead, the point here is to show how this film doesn't really advocate for a belief in any coherent dogma. It doesn't lay down a set of rules and ask you to accept them. For the most part, the movie defines Christianity through a set of negative statements. Christianity isn't Islam. It's not irritating yuppies, and it's not leftist academia. But Christianity isn't something clear besides not being those things. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's Not Dead isn't a great movie, you know? It's pretty all over the place and kinda stupid. But I do think it's an important movie. America is increasingly becoming a religiously divided nation. In the last 10 years, the number of Americans without religious affiliation has increased by 19 million. Meanwhile, evangelical Christians became the majority among US Christians. More than that, evangelicals were instrumental in getting Trump elected. They turned out in record numbers to vote for the guy. It's easy to look at this trend and look at Christianity and think this conflict comes down to their beliefs versus our beliefs. You know, their god has it that gayness is bad, but we don't think that, so we have a problem. And yeah, that is an issue. But then we have God's Not Dead, a movie which is made to capitalize on the nation's divisions which says that Christianity is under attack and that we have to come to its defense. And implicitly, the film claims that we have it all wrong. From the movie's perspective, America isn't in a conflict of beliefs or faith, but rather it's in a conflict of rhetoric. And considering how well this film did, how it sparked a genre of evangelical propaganda movies, we have to think that it's onto something. So, that's all I had to say about God's Not Dead. Uh, I would love to make more stuff about Pure Flick Studios. I mean, there's so many movies that are so interesting that they've made, and I've really only, you know, sweeped the surface. That's not the phrase. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you like this one, uh, tell me in the comments. See you next time.